I'm going to take you guys to a very different place in this world, a place where the next billion users are coming online. This is this new demographic that are coming online and are absolutely enthusiastic about digital media. And they're transforming the internet in ways we cannot even imagine. So, <laughs> I, I love the way it's like, maybe you. <laughs> oh, well, are we getting the clicker right? All right, so let's see if this works. <laughs> All right, okay, we're back on. All right, so hello again. I mean, in this, you know, this sort of like momentary lapse is sort of a, a lifetime for our attention span, so thank you for being around. All right, so getting back on track. I'm a digital anthropologist, and basically that's a fancy way of saying that I look at what people do with digital media, right, in their everyday lives. And for more than a decade, I've been particularly fascinated by people who live in low-income communities, like slums in India, favelas in Brazil, to townships in South Africa, because, you know, what was fundamentally driving me was that given the extraordinarily different conditions and context, are they, are their use, you know, desires, aspirations, user behaviors fundamentally different from us? And so I, when I started this research, it was quite a fringe research, you know, because these guys were not market worthy. Today, on the other hand, has, it's become a hot topic, right? Uh, Google just launched their next billion user lab end last year. Uh, Wall Street and many of the companies across board have decided that the next billion has to be a radical disruptor of their business model. So now I'm hip, my research is hip, so I'm glad the book has come out now, right? But in all honesty, who are these people? Well, quite a number of them are young. We're talking about 36% of the population. Um, and uh, about 85% of them live outside the West. And here is a clincher. Majority of them are low-income populations, but are upwardly mobile, right? So in terms of demographics, as Europe and you know, the, basically the US across board the West declines in number in terms of uh, how many young people are uh, being produced. On the other hand, there's an exponential growth in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Then if you look at the context of where do they live, one billion of this population live in low-income housing, often informal and illegal, right? They're informal settlements. And that is expected to grow to two billion by 2030. So imagine this, by default, they're criminal by being born out there, right? And keep this in mind as we talk more about privacy, when we're talking about a lot of these communities are run by parallel governance structures, drug lords, mafia, militias, uh, you know, the Sharia law uh, people. There's all kinds of governance, and the actual national government often has very little room. And then there's a very disturbing trend right now, right? A 2018 report last year said that the gender divide in mobile uptake is growing up to 40%. And some of the reasons are, well, the pay gap, right, between women and men, which does not allow women to purchase uh, data plans, mobile internet in a way that men can. So that's one, cultural norms, where women are pressured to use these technologies for more instrumental purposes, like calling home or emergency or something very utilitarian. But here's another very important reason, is they're choosing also to move away from the internet, particularly as the rise of misogyny, to uh, hate speech, and a lot of toxic behaviors you know, come up where often they have to pay the price of death, right? If you're following the media recently, two women uh, in Pakistan were uh, killed. Honor killings is very common because they were videotaped, clapping hands at a wedding. Just, just picture that, right? So on a more positive note, 
there's been some serious radical disruptions in a way that is actually uh, speeding up the process of these next billion users, not just coming online, but staying as long as possible. Geo, right? I sound like an ad here, but and I'm not sponsored by them. Although, if they want to sponsor me, sure, right? So, uh, I mean, Geo was a, uh, is a telecom initiative that came up in 2016, and what it did, it was by this multi-billionaire Ambani from Reliance, and what this did was it made data the cheapest in the world today. We're talking about 20 cents per GB versus, say, 5 to 6 euros in Europe to $16 in the US. And it's, it's, what's really interesting is the latest media report, KPMG, on Indian uh, user patterns came up with this like, astounding statistic. The demographic that is consuming the highest digital video content comes from the lowest socioeconomic classes. That is blowing my mind, right? And validating what I've been talking about for the last decade. So let's see how we can approach the next billion users by first disrupting some of the common myths surrounding them, right? The myth is the global poor are more utility driven than us. There's a sort of innate instinctive belief that surely because these people come with such different contexts and conditions that surely they are extraordinarily different from us. And my findings after more than a decade is my aha moment is something extraordinarily ordinary, is that if anything, they are very much like you and I. They want what we want. They want to consume entertainment, listen to music a lot. They want to watch porn. They want to socialize online. They want to romance. They want to game, all right? Majority of the data is being diverted towards those purposes. In fact, the internet is their leisure economy. In fact, it can also be their only leisure economy. And you know, when you step back, it makes sense, right? Think about it, they are in dehumanizing jobs, often in factories for 14 to 16 hours, very few breaks. They are stuck in traffic, riding auto, rickshaw, auto rickshaws or tuk-tuks or, you know, so they are in extraordinarily mundane, repetitive, you know, dehumanizing tasks. And so entertainment, like a radio or music or listening to a show, it like takes them and allows, it becomes a critical coping mechanism for them to cope with their everyday lives. And yet, when you look at policy and business models, there's an underlying Maslowing thinking. Maslow thinking is basically this kind of pyramid of needs, which came up in the 60s, which said if you want to look at low-income communities, we need to understand that the poor have to go through a trajectory. They have to satisfy their physiological needs first, psychological needs, and et cetera, et cetera, until they go into self-actualization. What I'm arguing here today is we need to turn that pyramid on its head. It's not about the needs, it's about the wants. And they are indeed irrational, because they will let their wants, their aspirations, their desires drive them, and that is the single most powerful reason why they're getting online. So then we have the, the second myth is the West is imitated by the um, uh, rest, right? So um, here's a question for you guys. How many here would accept a friend request from a total stranger? Raise your hands. Nobody. Wow, so actually you're even more ruthless than the typical statistics out here. <laughs> so actually, indeed, less than 4% of people in Europe and the US would actually accept, and clearly that 4% is not here. But get this, right? About half to two thirds of the friends that people have online outside the West, whether it's in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, are total strangers. Why? Because they use it as LinkedIn and Tinder and a whole bunch of other apps rolled into one. It is their public space. And here's a very interesting study. BBC said, uh, you know, did a, a massive global study and showed that while Europeans, for example, Germans, uh, for instance, don't see themselves as global citizens, less than 25%, 
a lot of these countries, about 80 to 85% see themselves as global citizens. And in my fieldwork, majority of these young people in slums or in uh, favelas said, yes, I am a global citizen. I follow Bill Gates, you know? I mean, I love Angelina Jolie. You should see my Photoshop picture with her, right? And see, this is about aspiration and belonging. And let us not forget that when we are looking at consumption behavior. About Netflix, of course, it's a radical disruptor based on our current media empires. But when we are talking about Netflix being imported to all these other countries, it is not really the pegging point we need to look at. Why? Because the real media empires are not the conventional formal media empires. It's the informal economy, the piracy economy, which dictates 60 to 80% of users' consumption. For a simple reason is because if you look at the past of media consumption, it costs an average low-income person a monthly wage to buy a CD or a DVD. That is not a real choice in the economy. So they don't actually see that the market is working for them. So of course, they're moving into this parallel economy, which exists around the world. And that is what we're competing with. In South Africa, for example, during apartheid, Black populations which, who were like holed out in townships against their wishes were basically not even allowed to enter a movie theater. And the first movie theater came up in the 1990s. They were not waiting to be rescued so they could get entertainment until media businesses figured it out. They just took, went ahead because they wanted to consume. And if the market's not going to cater to them, somebody else will, right? And that's what we need to look at. Porn, and here's a question for you guys. Yes, feel comfortable. <laughs> so, how many of you guys do not watch porn? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I watch porn. So, you know, I'm, you know, here's the thing. If I said this in India, actually, that would be a huge shocker. Probably is going to circulate back, obviously. But, <laughs> you know, here's the thing. Sexual desire is so normal. And yet, there is this tremendous moral panic surrounding it. In fact, the consequences of engaging in anything related to sex can be so devastating. Right? And we're talking about not just sex, it could be the whole spectrum from kissing to holding hands to hugging in public. All this, like the body is a taboo subject. Think about this, 98% of their relationships are arranged marriages. That means they don't get to choose their partner. Many of the young people I talked to was desperate to have experience. They wanted to feel like they had boyfriends and girlfriends. So they got online to friend Jane and from Ireland and, you know, Brazilian girls because apparently they're more likely to accept their friend requests. And they had full-blown relationships with them using Google Translate. You have to understand how important sexual desire is. And right now, Pornhub is the sex educator in majority of these countries where sex is taboo, you cannot talk about it, and there's seriously uh, major consequences, particularly for women, which is often led to honor killings, right? If you even remotely engage with the opposite sex. So, of course, Pornhub is the single most powerful reason why people are going online and are staying online. Any kind of porn consumption, look at the porn statistics. And yet, we shy away. Researchers don't even want to go there because we are so prudish, right? And if we look at the kinds of things that they're searching, what are Indians, for example, searching for? Their top searches, according to Pornhub, is sister-in-law. Why? Because they're in joint families, and here is one woman who is not their sister or their mother they can fantasize about, right? So, I mean, that's just my uh, sort of uh, amateur analysis here. So, <laughs> anyway, so trickle down and catch up philosophy, right? So there's this notion that in the West, we innovate and we give it to the rest, which is absolute bullshit. Things have changed drastically. Look at just something as humble as battery life. The, for mobile phones to take off in the global south, in many of these countries where the, now the penetration rate is uh, above 100%, 
they had to understand something. They had to understand that electricity was a luxury. It took three to five days in, a, say, a place where I was uh, researching in rural Namibia to charge your phone. Sometimes it had to be, you had to pay for it, right? So, of course, battery life is significant for telecom uptake. And so what these companies pioneered long-lasting batteries and made it a top priority, which wouldn't have been our priority because it wasn't that consequential. And so it was a reverse innovation, reverse flow, right? FinTech, China is a decade ahead in FinTech, way above. Like the Americans are still talking about credit cards, okay? I mean, and if you look at smart cities, Singapore is breaking grounds on what they're doing on uh, smart cityfication. And, you know, here's another surprise. Majority of young people in, like, the, you know, these developing countries don't want to become a Europe or an America. They aspire to belong to a place like Singapore. Singapore is a role model, right? So this is partly, a lot of these innovations are going to be even more happening in these contexts because they don't have legacy infrastructures, which means also legacy politics and entrenched media systems and other kinds of empires to force themselves against. So I was listening to a podcast by Mike Pence because this is my favorite pastime, of course. And uh, Mike Pence, you know, is the next, uh, next to uh, dear Trump. And he was saying something very interesting. He said that we, are, we, as the West, are at a war. We are in an information war against the East. He literally said those words. West versus the East, right? The blanket East. And so with Huawei, as with any other future technology, you need to make a choice. Are you with us or against us? Very bush, right? So, um, but here's the a, here's a logic in this, is that the US, has lost all moral um, you know, standing. They are completely morally bankrupt in their kind of leadership today. So I'm sorry, we cannot accept this as a premise because right now you can't, as a global leader, supposedly, profess globalization when it suits you with Silicon Valley goods and services, and then when you realize that you're way behind, you profess protectionism in the sake of, for the name of security. It does not work that way. It is pure uh, anti-competitiveness. Myth four is privacy is a key driver for innovation. Now, I'm not saying privacy is not you know, valuable to many of these young populations around the world who are in these settings. Of course they are. If privacy is a fundamental human need. But what I will say is that privacy values are relative. They're not absolute and they're not the most important. They are in relation to other values that they hold dear. And what they hold dear is to be visible and heard. You have to understand these next billion users have for the longest part been neg neglected by all kinds of markets. They've not been catered to, so they've been spending far more in their income on basic goods than us. Okay, so at last now they get advertising. It's like people actually, in, you know, young people are like, wow, I'm a consumer. They felt special, which is completely a com different mindset. We think we're spammed, we're trying to get out of it, right? And so markets are recognizing them at last. For the first time, the government, as I showed you earlier, they live in informal illegal settlements. So technically, they are invisible to the state. They don't exist. So at law, and when they do exist, the state looks at them in a very paternalistic way. Farmers need to check crop prices. Women need to check healthcare information. No, they're going to watch Bollywood, and they're going to listen to music, and they're going to like uh, consume porn. And they're going to do a lot of different things that the paternal state is not going to accept, right? So here it is really important also to understand it's more important of interpersonal surveillance. They are often more concerned that their parents are looking at them, their brothers are surveying them, right? This, you know, the, the mafia in the favelas, like the militia, forces them to friend them, and they have to, and so they're being constantly watched on that. These are their concerns, and not some abstract government out there or GDPR, right? The last myth is automation is our future. So, you know, I, I was uh, assigned by the UN to do a sort of research on 
what are young entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs doing, and what kinds of products are they creating for the next billion? And what I found is that in spite of the huge diversity and creativity of these young entrepreneurs all over the world, all over Europe, they were coming up with very similar kind of products. It's basically these sort of arrogant, astounding, like school within an app, healthcare within an app, with the fundamental belief that communities are the barriers. The people are the barriers, right? And that somehow the consumer will get everything they ever ha wanted to have on an app. That is completely uh, in, heading in the wrong direction because what that's going to lead to is uh, contribute to the astounding legacy, like the graveyard of applications we have today. Why? Because we need to look at technologies as assistive technology because that's what all technology is, right? <laughs> so, I mean, look, we map out the problem and we will need to be humble about what technology can and cannot do. And when we see the problem, then we realize that human communities are very much embedded and human in the loop is not a little afterthought. It is a human uh, ecosystem and technology is in the loop. And we cannot forget that, right? So how do we proceed? We need to attend to a couple of things. The three, multimodality matters. Now, you can think about it this way. They are spending more in terms of the percentage of their scarce income than we are on their data plans. So what they are doing is they're demanding far more than what we should, because of course it's a luxury good. And that's something we should keep in mind. And this is why Facebook's zero uh, you know, application failed, which basically they thought, surely we will just offer them Facebook, but a watered down version with text only. It, it completely failed because people are like, are you kidding me? We are not second class consumers for second class goods. We are spending so much of our income, give us the top goods, right? The other is design matters. And so if you look at the history of poverty and consumption, poor people are high conspicuous consumers. What I mean by that is that there's a history of them consuming luxury goods which is irrational. They're spending so much of their income, often even going into debt to get like the latest iPhone. Why? It's about status. It's about signaling status so you can build social capital in your communities and that way you can move forward. It's a very different kind of thinking. And so if you look at Shenzhen, the Silicon Valley of China, they came up with a gold phone because people, gold is loved by a lot of Asians. And so it sold like hotcakes. 12 years later, Apple released their first gold phone into the Chinese market. 12 years later, right? And there's the third is governance matters. And for those who went for the Chinese panels yesterday, I thought that was, you know, on the WeChat ecosystem, I thought that was really, you know, dead on in the way this exemplifies, is that Governance is, as I said, there's no legacy infrastructures as much. So what people are craving about, of course they care about their privacy, but what they're craving more is, please get these systems to work. I want to be able to get on time somewhere. I want to be able to meet my friends. I want to be able to communicate with my families because I'm doing long distance with so many. Remember, a lot of these low-income laborers are long distance people. It's not the trendy, oh, I'm a white collar, you know, hobnobbing kind of person. We're talking about Bangladeshi construction workers moving to Dubai or UAE and their passports taken away and not seeing their family. We're talking about nurses from Philippines moving to Canada and not seeing their children for years. And so this really matters as they want to have an app where they can make their lives easier because time is really scarce. They're working 14 to 16 hours, very few breaks, right? And so governance really matters. So I'd like to leave with this, right? Is we are facing a deep pessimism bias. There's this whole surveillance capitalism is taking and engulfing our imagination. We cannot reform that which we do not love. Again, we cannot reform that which we do not love. So I want to ask you all to fall in love again with technology because it's more like a marriage than an affair, right? And so you've got to work at it. 
because you're in for the long haul. So let's think about it, of why we love technology, and then move forward, all right? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Do we have time for a question? No. We don't have time for a question, Chris? Yes? No, oh, I'm sorry, Paul, we don't. I'm sorry. Okay, now you're here. Come, 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 come. Having yes, questions. I get to ask. I'm back. Questions. I just want to do this encore. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, one thing I'm uh, interested in is you pointed out the uh, one of the myths: the fact that privacy for the next billion users is perhaps less important. Um, I was talking to uh, Dr. Philippe earlier, and she said she once asked an audience uh, of speaker of. Um, uh, uh, of tech, um, tech lovers, how much they cared about privacy or sharing their, their, their data. And 50% um, of the audience put their hands up. But if you asked the same question 10 years ago, you know, maybe 10% of people would have mm -hmm. put their hands up. So in 20 years' time, is that next billion then going to be concerned uh, about their privacy more so than now? Yeah, so or we, is it like a cultural difference? No, so we, we, we cannot go into that kind of thinking that because then what we're implicitly saying is that they are, there's a linear pathway yeah. and that the West is here and they are following and eventually they'll catch up, right? It's not going to work that way because privacy is a value that manifests itself based on the historical context, the way in which, like for example, joint family systems, right? It's not gone away because, it, like say in India, right? We were just talking earlier, is I come from India and we were, you know, we were both saying that we live in, it's very normal for us to live in joint family systems. Mm -hmm. And the wealthier you get, the more global you get, that cultural notion doesn't disappear, which means that my mother still doesn't need to knock on my door. She just walks in, okay? And I would love to I lock it, but then she would think I'm doing something really mean and wrong. So, which I probably am, but anyway. Um, porn, but thing, porn. Porn, exactly. Porn for good. That's my next book. So, <laughs> anyway. But, yeah. That's good. You guys better buy that when I write sell it. Sell like hotcakes <laughs> here. Okay, come launch in Hamburg. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah, so I mean, look, I mean, privacy is always, it's a value that is in relation not just to their context, but also to what's going on otherwise. And people have many ways in which they can also achieve their privacy behaviors because indeed, uh, we're talking about a world where authoritarianism is on the rise. So to face governance structures, it's like a David and Goliath situation. However, users are very creative. So often they use, I mean, look at teenagers. They can be private and public by using this whole language. Mm -hmm. they're, they're constantly inventing like uh, acronyms and ways in which to communicate with each other that even if we're reading what we're reading, we can't understand a damn thing. And so, and that is that kind of thinking is that is going to be infused. So people will achieve their privacy. They will get it because systems right now, unfortunately, around the world actually moving more towards authoritarianism. And people, like I said, are not going to wait around until democracy hits or, you know, kicks in or these big systems, it could take decades, generations. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took a hundred years to get the right to a weekend. Right? Did people wait around for leisure? No. no they just they, had it. They, they started yeah. surfing porn, yeah. <laughs> he likes the porn bit, I can I tell. I just love the fact that everyone's like, the, the discomfort. I love that. <laughs> in the room when he started to talk about it. Anyway, we have to move on, yes, but thank, thank you very you. much. Bye.